At the start of the 20th century, Libya was part of the Ottoman Empire, before being conquered by the Italian government in 1911-1912. In the 1920s, resistance against the occupation led to a military response. Hundreds of thousands of Libyans were murdered, forced to undertake death marches, locked into concentration camps, and more. In the 1940s, the nation became a theatre of war between the Allied and Axis governments, and, after the Second World War, Libya came under British and French government occupation. Independence finally came in 1951, with the monarchy of King Idris. Under the monarchy, political parties would be banned, and all electoral candidates were government-approved. The US and UK governments, as well as their militaries and national corporations, had both a presence and influence in Libyan politics, something which caused more and more social unrest as the pan-Arab movement grew in the rest of the region. In the 1960s, Idris, widely unpopular in the semi-autonomous regions of Cyrenaica and Fezzan, would further centralise power to himself. In late 1969, while abroad, a military coup led by an officer called Muammar al-Gaddafi took place, and his monarchy was dissolved, forcing Idris into exile. The new regime was led by a committee, the Revolutionary Command Council, or RCC, with Gaddafi as chairman and, thus, the head of state. The goal of the RCC was to rid Libya of European colonisation, and of those who supported it, so they could embark upon the greater cause of Arab nationalism. Gaddafi himself proclaimed that the goals of his revolution were freedom, unity and socialism, just like the Ba'ath Party in Syria and Iraq at the same time. Gaddafi saw Libya as part of the Arab nation, and reiterated that Islam would be the state religion. The dictatorship declared that it would ensure economic self-sufficiency, equity in distribution to the people, and would implement a new socialist system. Medical care and education were enshrined as universal rights under the revolutionary vanguard of the RCC. Similarly to other Arab nationalists, Gaddafi saw Arabs as superior to non-Arabs, but believed that the Arab nation had been severely weakened by colonialism and the subsequent Western government-backed monarchies. Unity, liberty and socialism would, as he saw it, restore the greatness of the Arab people. Unity would be achieved through fostering nationalism, which in this case often meant asserting the right of Libyans to be free from foreign control of any kind. The month he came to power, Gaddafi ordered that all road signs, tickets and more should be written in no other language than Arabic. It was also later decreed that all foreign passports should be translated into Arabic if one wanted to travel to Libya and that a campaign would be launched to make Arabic an official international language in global organisations, such as the UN. Public entertainment and alcohol were also banned, presented as a move against foreign influences. The new regime also sped up a decision by the monarchy to not renew agreements with the British and American governments regarding the continued use of air bases in Libya. The days on which the last foreign troops left Libyan soil would become yearly national holidays in the country, as, too, did the day in 1970 when all Italians were expelled from the state and all Italian-owned financial assets nationalised. Other financial assets were also on the list. Within just a few years, all Libyan reserves in British banks were withdrawn, foreign-owned oil companies were forced to accept unfavourable deals with the government, or their assets were simply nationalised as part of a campaign to bring control of all things Libyan back to the Libyan people. Well, to the dictatorship which claimed to represent them, that is. In the Mediterranean, Gaddafi sought to undermine NATO's presence by convincing the Maltese government to cancel agreements on naval bases, and across Africa he sought to undermine the Israeli government by offering money to national governments who kicked out Israeli military advisers. These moves were widely popular, and worked towards Gaddafi's goal of making the population loyal to the regime. To this end, he would also exert greater influence over Libyan feminist movements. Theoretically, Libyan women could vote, since 1920 in fact, and own private property and financial assets independent of their husbands, as per Islamic law. In practice, however, things didn't always work out like this. Following Gaddafi's coup, men and women were promised legal equality, and the government undertook to increase the literacy levels of Libyan women, including by providing equal access to education for both boys and girls. There was to be no gender wage gap, nor unequal qualification requirements for jobs. Women's rights were an important part in Arab nationalism, but it was women's rights within the boundaries set for them by their patriarchal society. Women were expected to be wives and mothers before they were anything else, more often than not, which I'll talk about more later. 
Many of the new laws I just mentioned were often only half-heartedly implemented, and, despite calling himself the emancipator of women, Gaddafi was far more interested in increasing women's loyalty to the dictatorship than in helping them achieve equality. In 1970, a government-run group called the Women's General Union was founded, followed soon after by a women's military academy and an all-female personal bodyguard unit for the dictator. Regime control over the Women's General Union not only gave the government the ability to shape Libyan feminism towards its interests, but, by having been formed by a merger of multiple women's organisations, allowed greater surveillance powers over a potential source of dissent to the RCC. Like Ba'afists, Gaddafi believed that socialism was the key to liberty. However, the early years of the Gaddafi dictatorship were by no means socialist, and the rights of Libyan capitalists were defended by the regime. As far as the government was concerned at this time, foreign capitalists were their foe, not domestic ones, unless they were deemed particularly exploitative, which, in the context of Gaddafi's regime, often meant working for a foreign corporation. In the early to mid-70s, the private sector boomed. Over 50% of housing projects were completed by private companies, not the government. The new regime promoted the growth of an urban middle class through state intervention to help them, or, in the government's words, the public sector would help the private sector to overcome difficulties by providing financial and technical encouragement. In 1970, the RCC founded the Industrial Research Centre. Its goal was providing technical and economic services to industrialists from both the private and public sector, to assist in the energy industry. The government's real estate industrial bank would provide almost 300 private Libyan businessmen with loans between 1969 and 1972. In the eyes of the government, these loans were investments to get more money from the growth of the private sector. The more that was invested in production and industry now, it was argued, the more money the government would have at its disposal in future, to allow it to continue to push for self-sufficiency. Far from being socialist, Gaddafi in the early 1970s was arguably running a state capitalist system. Unsurprisingly, the government soon came to be in control of more money than any private citizen. Whereas in many other dictatorships, where the regime relied on the support and goodwill of the middle and capitalist classes, this was not so in Libya. As one author put it, the state was in a position to exclude them, from the administration of political power. In other words, the state in Libya did not govern on behalf of a ruling class. It was the embodiment of the ruling class. Founding the Libyan Arab Socialist Union in 1971, Gaddafi declared it an organisation by and for the working forces of the revolution, which also included non-exploitative capitalists. It was little more than a government mouthpiece, intended to increase regime control over the working class, and support the decisions made by Gaddafi and the RCC. In the LASU, trade unions, a centrepiece of many a socialist movement, were curtailed. As far as the dictator was concerned, they were a threat to his position. It is impermissible to conduct politics outside the LASU, in any union or profession. Otherwise, federations and trade unions would turn into parties, and there would not be a single organisation for the regime's working forces. We should talk a bit now about Gaddafi's views on religion and foreign policy, which were very linked. As far as Gaddafi was concerned, Islam was the religion of the Libyan state, something which separated him from the nominally secular dictatorships of other Arab nationalists. Gaddafi believed it vital that the government had the monopoly on religion. He declared that the Quran was the only source of the word of God, and rejected non-written teachings, including those attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. Dissent from Libyan religious leaders about Gaddafi's religious policies got them purged, alongside declarations that mosques were not to be treated as a place for politics. Likewise, the government targeted schools of religious legal thought, calling them unconnected with Islam, and little more than part of an attempt to gain political power. The regime wanted to use Islam to justify its coup, and subsequent policies, including foreign policy. A central part of Gaddafi's foreign policy lay in anti-imperialism. Seeing Western government imperialism as a threat to Islam itself, Gaddafi saw holy war as a significant method to combat imperialism. This led him to support many armed groups across the world, from Somali Muslims to Irish Republican Catholics and Marxist-Leninist Germans, providing weapons, training and financial support. To Gaddafi, the political or religious nature of the groups he supported didn't actually matter all that much, 
The idea that he was waging holy war against the imperialist governments did, because this not only fit with his nationalist and anti-imperialist worldview, but also increased his popularity, both in Libya and across the Arab world. In 1973, Gaddafi formalised and expanded his new ideology by unveiling what he called the Third International Theory, which he published a book about, simply called The Green Book, and it, theoretically at least, called for a quite different kind of society than the one his dictatorship had installed thus far. It offers to claim the ultimate remedy to society's problems, but it's mostly just a rephrasing of other pre-existing ideas. Also, it can be pretty rambling, and has loads of what feels like filler. Gaddafi argued that the main issue for societies in the modern day is the effects of power struggles, something which can only be solved by democracy. He rejected representative parliamentary democracy, such as that in the UK, as little more than a veiled dictatorship, where 49% of the population can have the will of 51% imposed upon them. In Gaddafi's mind, in a representative democracy, people are left with only a facade of democracy, manifested in long queues to cast their election ballots. This was because representatives and political parties were judged by Gaddafi to work only in their own interests, and those interests are often only those of the rich, not that of society at large. If Parliament is formed from one party, as a result of its winning an election, it becomes a Parliament of the winning party, and not of the people. Under such systems, the people are the victims, whose votes are vied for by exploitative competing factions, who dupe the people into political circuses that are outwardly noisy and frantic, but inwardly powerless and irrelevant. Thus, the Third International Theory would be democratic, but political parties would be banned. Not only would this make society more free, Gaddafi argued, but also less conflict-riven, as the existence of many parties intensifies the struggle for power, and this results in the neglect of any achievements for the people, of any socially beneficial plans. Such actions are presented as a justification to undermine the position of the ruling party, so that an opposing party can replace it. The parties very seldom resort to arms in their struggle, but rather denounce and denigrate the actions of each other. This is a battle which is invariably waged at the expense of the higher, vital interests of the society. Some, if not all, of those higher interests will fall prey to the struggle for power between instruments of government, for the destruction of those interests supports the opposition in their argument against the ruling party or parties. It should be remembered that, despite what he was saying about freedom and democracy, Gaddafi was the dictator of Libya. Under Gaddafi's system, committees would be the instrument of democracy. Local people would form basic popular conferences. These people would vote on one of their members to become the secretariat and join what was called a non-basic popular conference. The basic popular conferences would then vote on an administration-oriented people's committee to undertake the now-replaced role of civil servants in the previously government-run bureaucratic system. Public institutions would be managed by the people's committees, who carry out the policies voted upon by the basic popular conferences. There would also be job-specific committees to handle workplace issues. All issues decided upon in the conferences would find their way to the General People's Congress, made up of all the secretariats of the popular conferences and people's committees, who would vote on the decisions according to the democratic votes of the basic popular conferences. While this might just sound like people voting for a series of representatives, the thing Gaddafi wanted to avoid, he claimed it was different because the General People's Congress is not a gathering of persons or members, but rather a gathering of the popular conferences and people's committees. No single entity or person would be allowed to unilaterally create laws under a third international theory system, although in practice, of course, Gaddafi did exactly that. In the dictator's mind, the only valid laws were natural laws, which came from tradition, which were enshrined in religion, according to his arguments. As such, there would be no constitution, because those were man-made and thus invalid, and a tool of government control. Under third international theory, a free press is protected, and private ownership of media would be forbidden, with Gaddafi having written that newspapers were not a means of expression for private individuals or corporate bodies. The news media would be published by the People's Committees, with the idea being that all sectors of society would be included in its creation, and thus keep it as democratic and representative of the people as possible. 
The name Third International Theory comes from the fact that Gaddafi considered his system to be an alternative to the dominant capitalist and communist ideologies of the day. This third way was also the view of Mussolini, with fascism. In many ways, the Green Book was indeed a rejection of Marxism and the Marxist-Leninism of the Soviet Union. It rejected a class-based revolution as unworkable, arguing that the result would still be a new class-based society, but with a different face. Gaddafi argued that the proletarian revolution in other nations had simply led the government to become the new employer, making them effectively capitalist and still subject to a system of wage labour. In many more ways, however, Gaddafi's theories were just reworded Marxism. Gaddafi said that working to produce a product for another person, in exchange not for that product but for money, did little more than make the worker a slave to the owning class, as they relied entirely on them to get products despite the fact that they spent their own day producing things. Gaddafi's solution was to abolish the wage system, emancipating people from its bondage and reverting to the natural laws which defined relationships before the emergence of classes, forms of government and man-made laws. This, too, was basically Marx's view on wage labour. So, too, was the theme of what economic system came next. In Marx's mind, human economic systems had begun with a form of proto-communism, and when that system ceased to be, there was a progression through an enslaved person-based mode of production to a feudal mode, to a capitalist mode, which he believed would, through revolution, be transformed into a communist economy. To Friedrich Engels, Marx's associate, the original proto-communist system broke down due to the advent of private property and changes in family organisation away from a system of communal motherhood that he argued came with farming. In Gaddafi's mind, the natural economic system was subverted by man-made laws, the emergence of social classes, exploitation and profit accumulation. However, one clear difference is that Marx saw communism as a natural progression from the socio-economic effects of capitalism whereas Gaddafi saw Third International Theory as simply returning to the way he thought things should be, based on his idea of historic, political and economic systems, as well as his theory of natural religion-derived laws. Another similarity with Marxism is that Gaddafi wanted to implement workers' control of the means of production, and that the wealth and productivity of society should be shared with each worker receiving that which he needs, but not so much that he makes profit over his fellow workers. Moreover, landlords would be abolished, and the concept of money and profit-making itself would, in time, just as Marx believed, become irrelevant and be abolished. Gaddafi, though, claimed that his theory was based upon natural laws derived from Islam, and was a counter to atheistic Marxist socialism. He once described his own form of socialism as Islamic scientific socialism. In the Green Book, Gaddafi argues that humans have several basic fundamental needs. The first of these is housing, and as such, no person can own the house of another person. Landlords would be abolished, for they infringed upon the needs of others and took away their freedom. Similarly, Gaddafi also saw land ownership, in general, as wrong, saying that everyone had the right to use the land. To satisfy their needs, but without employing others with or without a wage. Work for wages, in addition to being enslavement, as previously mentioned, is void of incentives, because the producer is a wage earner and not a partner. Self-employed persons are undoubtedly devoted to their work, because from it they satisfy their material needs. Likewise, those who work in a collective establishment are also devoted to their work, because they are partners in it, and they satisfy their material needs from the production. The second need was income. As Gaddafi put it, in a socialist society there are no wage earners, but only partners. One's income should either be managed privately to meet one's needs, or be a share from a production process, of which one is an essential component. It should not be a wage in return for production. The final need was that of transportation, and so Gaddafi argued that no person could privately own the transport required by other people, such as car renting or private taxi services, without infringing on their freedom. One interesting thing in his theory is that, although he is completely against profit accumulation, he does say that disparity in the wealth of individuals in the new socialist society is not tolerated, save for those rendering certain services to the society for which they are accorded an amount congruent with their services. Individual shares only differ relative to the amount of production 
or public service rendered in excess. While I can't prove it, it feels to me like this would be his justification for the fact he was a billionaire. Of course, third international theory was also a nationalist ideology. This is where there is a big difference from the mostly reworded Marxism we saw earlier and the part of the book where Gaddafi's social conservatism is most obvious. Gaddafi rejected the Marxist notion that the driving force of history was the class struggle between the working class and the owning class, instead basically arguing that it was the national struggle that brought societies together. Just as the community is the basis for the survival of all groups within the animal kingdom, so nationalism is the basis for the survival of nations. His understanding of nationalism was based in his idea that it was a natural, scientific law of nature. Planets were kept together by their gravitational pull, just as people were kept together by nationalism. In the same way that the explosion of atomic bombs see the atoms around the nucleus dispersed, he argued, so too would dissolution of natural structures befall any society which didn't adhere to what he believed was the natural law of nationalism. Gaddafi also believed that each nation had to have a single religion, as this would also increase the harmony of the national community. Gaddafi's idea of natural laws really acts as a foundation for his belief system. He believed that the family unit formed the basis of social cohesion, regarding the tribe as simply an extension of the family, and the nation as an extension of that. But that the nation required society's utmost consideration. Tribalism damages nationalism because tribal allegiances weaken national loyalty and flourishes at its expense. In the same way, loyalty to the family flourishes at the expense of tribal loyalty and weakens it. National loyalty is essential to the nation. Gaddafi regarded the entire world as a family of nations, though he did think his was the best, and that they should act like strong individuals who have self-respect and are aware of their own individual responsibilities, who are important and useful to the society. Just as a strong and respectable family, which is aware of its importance, is socially and materially beneficial to the tribe. In Gaddafi's mind, the nation was not a political structure, but a natural social one, just as he believed families were natural social and not political structures. In this way, he thought, a nation-state founded upon natural nationalism could not fall, and even if suppressed by external aggression and colonialism, would revive itself in a national struggle against it. Empires, he argued, did not follow the natural law of nations, but were political creations and thus were destined to fall. Gaddafi also had an entire chapter on women's role in third international theory, and it's painful to read. He starts by asserting the inherent equality of men and women, and that discrimination towards women is a flagrant act of oppression. Then goes on a weird ramble about why women exist, badly explains the concept of menstruation, and argues that because men and women are different, there must naturally be different societal gender roles intended for them, and, yes, he says that motherhood is the only natural role of women. He is also weirdly angry at nurseries, comparing them to chicken farms, and says that children need to be raised by their families, not by other adults, with his proof being that chickens that weren't raised by their mothers aren't as tasty as chickens who were. Gaddafi also lays out that, in his political system, the concept of women working was unnatural, and a form of tyranny which took them away from the role of motherhood and even says that women are deluding themselves if they think they want to find employment. Outside of motherhood, Gaddafi also argues that women exist to look nice and be gentle, while men exist to be strong and striving. And for them to divert from these roles amounts to a wanton act of corruption against the values of life itself. Under third international theory, education would, theoretically, not be state-controlled, for this was regarded as tyranny and suppression of the human spirit. Rather, people should be able to learn whatever they want to learn. In summary of the Third International Theory earlier on in his book, Gaddafi says that it heralds emancipation from the fetters of injustice, despotism, exploitation, and economic and political hegemony, for the purpose of establishing a society of all the people, where all are free and share equally in authority, wealth, and arms. Freedom will then triumph definitively and universally. Spoiler alert, this is not what happened in Gaddafi's dictatorship following the publishing of the Green Book. In 1977, Gaddafi had the Libyan Republic dissolved, 
and replaced with the great socialist People's Libyan Arab People's State, with his title in it being Head of the Revolution. With Gaddafi in this position, it was possible for the Libyan population to make decisions against his will in their conferences, but overwhelmingly Gaddafi did whatever he wanted, and would often use the General People's Congress as a form of rubber stamping for his pre-decided ideas. Power in Libya remained where it had before, in the hands of a wealthy, corrupt, and murderous military dictatorship. Let's go back to women's rights. Despite what he'd written in the Green Book about women not looking after children as being against the laws of nature or something, he tried to enrol women in the armed forces and into military academies, in large part aimed at instilling in them devotion to his rule. One author has labelled the government-approved women's rights movement of Gaddafi's Libya as militarised feminism. When he was chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council, Gaddafi had passed laws providing state-funded childcare for women, but in the Green Book argued that nursery was unnatural and that farm bread chickens don't taste very nice. Gaddafi, despite his self-given title of Emancipator of Women, was by no means concerned about emancipation. Rather, he sought to do two things make the women of Libya fanatically loyal to his dictatorship, and reinforce their existing place in patriarchal, conservative Libyan society. Except for those in his military academies, women were not to work, but to stay at home, serve, and look nice for men. In the late 1970s, the Libyan economy began to shift away from state capitalism towards Gaddafi's version of socialism. Hundreds of companies came under worker control, the government began the process of land redistribution, and one dinar became the largest currency denomination, and all other notes were to be exchanged for a maximum of 1,000 dinars, regardless of how much you exchanged it for, in order to wipe out excess savings and equalise people's share of wealth. In 1981, the government took control of all imports, exports, and domestic distribution. All Libyans, with some exceptions, such as those in the higher echelons of the regime, were forbidden from owning multiple homes, and landlords had their extra houses taken from them by the government and given to the occupants, who had to pay a small mortgage based on family income to the government in return. However, not all of Gaddafi's proclamations came to pass. It was still common to rent out one's car or provide taxi services. Land reform was slow and not always dealt with fully. Job-specific committees were denied to oil and migrant workers, the government's two main sources of income. And there were almost just as many migrant workers as native workers. This meant that almost half of the nation's workforce were denied the rights of the other half and continued to be employees, rather than partners in collectively owned companies. Moreover, many of those Libyans, who were formerly more rich than the average citizen, had managed to keep their wealth by avoiding exchanging their money as the government ordered and instead converting it into foreign currencies. The government, meanwhile, was having trouble with its new distribution role. While family-owned shops were allowed to continue to be owned by families, major supermarkets came under government control in the form of the General Marketing Company and became People's Supermarkets. Those who had owned supermarkets and other shops, especially from the middle class, grew resentful of the regime and, often with the help of imams, would organise boycotts of the People's Supermarkets declaring the government's seizure of their private property as contrary to the teachings of the Quran. The government responded with arrests, dismissals of imams, and closed down some mosques. Some of the trials of the former business owners were televised as a publicity stunt to turn public opinion against them. Gaddafi's foreign policy, meanwhile, would start to have harmful effects on his economy. Relations with the US government in the 1980s were confrontational, which resulted in the president, Ronald Reagan, putting sanctions on the regime which put more pressure on the economy. The people's supermarkets were plagued by government incompetence and corruption, which led to shortages. In 1982, the basic popular conferences voted to bring back limited private agricultural produce selling to compensate. The government had also gotten itself into debt, often over working contracts, and by the mid-1980s, the government was implementing austerity measures. While many went without food items, those in power did not. They had their own supermarkets, better access to travel, and access to better housing and medical care than other Libyans. As the economy continued to worsen, and discontent mounted, Gaddafi began another massive policy shift from 1987. In his propaganda, it was a revolution within the revolution. In short, it meant capitalism. In 1988, Gaddafi declared an end to the government control of trade and distribution, leading to a return of privately owned shops, 
Discontent against his regime continued to mount, however, in large part due to the conditions caused by UN sanctions enacted in response to Gaddafi's foreign policy. In 1999, in order to have them lifted, Gaddafi began to cooperate with the UN over one of his terror operations in Britain, the Lockerbie bombing. Ignoring the hostility to capitalism inherent in the Third International Theory, and discontent from many parts of the population to foreign businesses having more of a role in their country's economy, in 2000 the government asked investors to put their money into a newly liberalising Libyan market. Many investors, however, didn't feel entirely comfortable about Libya, seeing its regime as too erratic to trust. For example, in 2003, Gaddafi declared that the private sector was a decided failure, and four months later, his regime published a list of over 350 companies ready to be privatised. Within four years, the regime would create a stock market, had lifted a lot of tariffs, and no longer required foreign documents to be translated into Arabic as an entry requirement, all in the hope of attracting foreign investment. Once more, public discontent rose alongside fears of job security due to foreign competition, as well as the government raising the price of fuel and electricity. Gaddafi's regime wanted more investment, not least in areas outside of just the oil sector. The dictator, however, was concurrently saying in 2006 that too much investment risked money leaving Libya for abroad, that the people were too reliant on foreign imports when they should be making their own products and strengthening the domestic economy, and encouraged unemployed Libyans to move to other African countries to find work. Despite trying to fit in with the globalised capitalist system, the regime hadn't entirely forgotten its third international theory ideology. Overall, they were either not at all or barely sticking to it, but they would pay lip service to it, arguing that all privatisation had to be in accordance with the people's socialism principles of the Green Book, even arresting some Libyan businessmen for creating monopolies. This did little to increase the confidence of foreign investors, but regardless, money was pouring in, especially from European and North American corporations. However, within a few years, Libya was embroiled in a civil war. Many of those same foreign corporations would hope to profit from the aftermath. 